This is from Sex Ed Matters. They say they uh, deliver empowering sex, ed- ed- empowering sex education at schools. I suppose me saying you say that uh, implies that I don't believe it. Apologies for that, Helen. Morning. Um, I think you've got Morning. the wrong. Um, I think you've got the wrong organisation. That's not the name of my organisation. What, what is I work name? for a, a human rights charity called Sex Matters. We don't offer sex education. Okay. Well, my my apologies then. What do you think of uh, the changes? Um, overall, very much in the right direction. That's a really tragic story that we just heard from your um, previous interviewee. Um, of course, there are children of two, three, four, five who also get sexually abused. We can't teach children of every age about sex as our main way to respond to sexual abuse. We have to safeguard children. Um, but, you know, of course, this, this man has his own particular story. Um, what the government is trying to do here is it's trying to push back against overly sexualized material that we know is going into schools at primary age and also the spread of transgender ideas into sex education we've seen terrible examples in which children are told that what makes them a boy or a girl is whether they um, fit into the stereotypes for boy or girl. And we have chapter and verse examples of that. And the government heard from plenty of parents and plenty of teachers too, that although most provision was pretty good, there was a large and growing fringe of really not good and not age appropriate, not safeguarding informed and very ideological Uh, material that is creeping into sex education. So the government is not saying that most of it is bad. It's saying that we need to have clarity so that there isn't bad provision around the edges. We're saying that um, children don't need to be taught about um, sex uh, up until year five. Yeah, I mean, that's that's only about age nine. I mean, what you need to teach children before that is, you know, some people have two mummies, some people have two daddies. Uh, You know, if you don't like to be touched, if you don't want to be touched, you shouldn't be touched. You don't need to talk to them about the birds and the bees really before about age nine. And actually some safeguarding experts say that doing so makes it less likely that we will spot the abused children. Because one of the red flags for early sexual abuse is children who use overly sexualized language. So if children are being taught things that are not age appropriate and that are scary for them, it's harder to spot the children who have had experiences that children of their age shouldn't. Remember, most safeguarding is not about what the children know. That's putting the burden of safeguarding on the child. It's up to adults to make sure that, for example, the priest who sexually abused your previous interviewee wasn't able to be alone with that child. Adults shouldn't be alone with children like that. So we stop those things well, with a whole know, range lots, of measures. Lots, well, I don't know. There are lots of there are lots of jobs that I would go for if I wanted to interfere with children. That that means that you would be alone with the child. I, I'm interested. No, it I'll doesn't. Not not in proper safe not in proper safeguarding arrangements. Well, no, adults well, don't uh, well, don't don't uh, end up alone with children like that. Well, no. If, if if I was a swimming teacher and I was in the pool trying to teach a, a child how to swim, I would have physicality. If I if if I but you would you would also be in public. You would not be alone with a single child. Well, it doesn't mean that if I there are stories of people uh, who have interfered with people in in plain view. Uh, what I'm interested in, and I have to use the experience of the person who came on the show, if you don't mind, that as somebody, how long ago was uh, that? Uh, Things have uh, changed uh, a lot. Yeah. Let me ask you the question, please. If 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 he, as somebody, you know, it's really difficult because in the years that I've been doing this, I've, I try to learn not to challenge people's lived experience. Does that make sense? So if somebody's been through something, I have to try and listen and understand it in a different kind of way to an opinion. And in his lived experience, he didn't have the language because it wasn't talked about at all to be able to express himself. And what he went on to say was his worry is if you leave it to year five, because different people are brought up differently in different homes, it may be that there are other children who are exposed to the same sort of thing as him. Can you not hear what I'm saying when I say that children are abused at age two, three, four as well? And this is an argument for teaching children at age two about sex, because you would have to then have 
the children able to use the language at that age. That's not, with the greatest possible respect, the, um, the most appropriate way to think about the issue of sexual abuse. Also, sex education isn't solely about protecting children from sex, sexual abuse. It's also just about teaching them about themselves. If you teach children the birds and the bees very young, you very much alarm little children. They're not ready to hear it. It's a very delicate balance, and most schools already get this right. But there are some schools that are teaching materials that are totally inappropriate for children that are very young, you know, really very sexualized about fringe sexual practices. We have seen this material. Parents know this. What's not a fr- all parents, what's a not even most parents. What's a fringe sexual practice? Uh, for example, anal sex, talking about this in primary school. That's quite terrifying for a child. Mm. It's totally inappropriate, have and you, yet it I've happens. Never, I've, never, I've, never, I've never heard, personally... Um, and and I take calls four days a week, I read, I talk to as many people as I can. I've never heard about um, it in that language being taught to a child in primary school. Have you? Well, it has been, yes. And and the DfE has received these materials too from parents who are worried about it. and and it. And if it is taught, then wouldn't it be up to... Because anything that we put in, right is going to be interpreted by teachers, by education departments, and and will be subject... So what you're taught in one school won't be what you're taught in a different area. Uh, if something is inappropriate, is deemed inappropriate, should that not be dealt with on an individual basis? Do you realise that at the moment parents don't have the right to see PSHE materials and part of what the guidance that comes out today is saying is that parents must have that right? And in, so that we can really have oversight of what's being taught and pick up when materials are inappropriate. Um, more, more than the um, actual issues of particular sex acts, it's also the, um, the confusion between sex and gender identity and the much more widespread problem of telling children that everybody has a gender identity, which is a completely unscientific and ideological position, and that children who are not performing the stereotypes associated with their sex might be trans. And this has been a big part of why so many more children are identifying as trans how and why wide, we've seen a bigger number. How widespread do you think that is? So I think what Gillian Keegan said to you is that she hasn't done an actual um, you know, she said it wasn't statistical that widespread. study. I think she said it wasn't um, Well, for example, I know that Pop and Ollie is one group that does this. They produce materials for primary schools that says that everybody has a gender identity, that gender is a spectrum. Uh, they work with 100 plus schools in their area. Uh, they're in the west of the country. That's one example. The Proud Trust produces similar materials. They work with hundreds of schools. So these are not, you know, one tiny school here and there. They're definitely hundreds of schools. I've heard about this from parents myself, and I know that parents wrote to the DfE and said, I don't want my children taught that everybody has a gender identity. I don't want them taught that what makes you a girl is performing the stereotypes associated with a girl. Girls can do anything. Girl girl is just a fact about yourself, and we can do anything we like, and it doesn't make us not girls. So there's a real problem here. It's not 100% of schools, but it's not 0.1% of schools either. And there's no reason why there shouldn't be a national curriculum or at least a framework for this particular area of education, just as there is with every other area of education. Uh, let's get to the older kids now. W- what is what is the big push here in terms of the older kids? Because I, I think some of what you've talked about is more pertinent to the older kids and not necessarily, as so far as I can see, talk to kids in primary schools. So how we, you know, as a parent, you know what I'm most worried about with the older kids, I suppose, uh, is is the impact of of social media, how long they spend on it, and what they see. How big a gig do you think that is? How big a challenge do you think that is? Oh, I mean, it's huge. I mean, what children are seeing online at younger and younger ages is more and more upsetting. And I think there's a big generation gap here. Those of us who are a bit older maybe aren't aware of just just how unpleasant the material is. And we forget how different it is that it's in children's pockets on their phone compared with something that you might have had to go to a news agent and be asked if you're over 18 for for the older so, among but, us. But what do you think a school's responsibility is with that? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because they can't ignore the fact that children are seeing very inappropriate materials, but then as soon as you start to talk about inappropriate materials yourself, you risk being inappropriate. So I do think that most teachers are um, very much keen on having guidance on how to deal with this because the world that children are in is a difficult one. Um, and it's difficult for grown-ups to guide them on it. Um, when they, and, you know, when they don't to understand do it the world it's very difficult. 
it's really difficult. It, 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 yeah, it's it's really difficult for everybody. So I, I, I really am so sorry that this guidance has been, um, you know, picked up on in this very negative way because really overall what it's doing is it's saying this is a fast evolving area because of the way the internet is going and the way that like, the world is changing. It's a really difficult teaching challenge. Many schools are doing it well. Some are struggling. A few are really not getting this right. Um, and we just need to have greater clarity and consistency. What would you if you tell read my the lessons? actual draft guidance, I, it's I, great. I am reading it. What, 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 is, what information would you give um, my parents listening now uh, in regards to the social media? Because when I speak to teachers, they are um, really worried about the Andrew Tate uh, effect. Yes, I'm what, worried what, about what, that why, too. Yeah. Why is he so alluring, so seductive and so influential over many of our children? I mean, lots of children are looking around to explain the world that they're in. And because they've got phones, they can go online and look. And, you know, children are, by definition, immature. And boys who feel that, you know, the world has gone against them, and this is not necessarily anything to do with sex education, actually. It's to do with things like house prices and worries about jobs and so on. You know, they feel there's no role anymore for boys. And that's a very, very um, fertile ground for somebody seductive like Andrew Tate to you say to anything it's feminism's said? fault. Have you listened I have to... listened because I need to understand mm, um, what no, young oh, men are listening to. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think of what you I, said? I, I could totally imagine if I was an angry 14 or 15-year-old boy finding it convincing. And that really worries me. I'm actually more worried about the pornography, I have to say. I'm more worried about the boys looking at porn, the girls knowing the boys are looking at porn, the girls looking at porn too, children getting the idea that you have to be super pneumatic and, you know, always on in order to be attractive, um, that that's what the their peers are looking at and what they're going to be expected to do. You know, this is for both boys and girls, and it's, you know, it's happening from 13, 14, 15. That's the main thing I'd want your parents to understand that really children are seeing quite grotesque porn, very young. I, I'm wondering, and maybe it's naively, if if I put in the work in terms of relationships, how you treat people at an early age, whether or not I give myself or my family, my boys, a, 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 a better chance. But I suppose if they can scroll and see all sorts and that goes unchallenged and they think that's normal, then that's a yeah. big problem being stocked up for society, isn't it? Completely. And that doesn't mean that parents shouldn't do exactly what you said. What you said is exactly right. You talk to children, you be open with children, you teach them good values, you teach them that, you know, consent is important and respect for other people, but respect for themselves too, respect for their own boundaries. But you know what, if there's a tidal wave of disgusting material coming into their pockets, and you are totally ignorant of that, that's a huge problem for you. And there's only so much that each individual parent can do. We need to work together to fix these problems. And that means schools, and it probably means thinking very hard about phones and what age children have unsupervised access to phones. But you're, yes, teachers you, have a you, really you difficult a job are you here. A parent? Are you a parent? I am. My, my boys are 23 and 18 now, but I'm the eldest of nine kids too, so I've got 20 nieces so and do, nephews yeah, who are younger. I just wonder, do, 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 you, do you think it's more difficult for me now with a 10 and 15-year-old or just different, uh, or more difficult? Oh, it, it, more difficult every year. Oh, every oh, year, that's what it I gets harder. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Every year, the, the culture that children are in is more different than the culture that their parents were in. And so we are more and more blind to what's going on. And then these new things come up like Andrew Tate, and every, every teenager knows about what he says before even adults noticed that he exists. And then that's just one example. You know, girls are getting the same quite pornified idea of what it is to be a girl. Thank you for talking to me. I, I, I really appreciate it. And apologies for getting the name of your organisation wrong. I, I do apologise uh, for that. Uh, Helen Joyce from Sex Matters.